Welcome back to the Tech Shack for another low quality video. Now I did a similar video a while back, but it had even worse audio than usual and the network has changed a bit since then, so I thought I'd update the Starlink and Omada network video as well as provide an updated home office tour. So we installed Starlink well over a year now, it's been about a year and a half, and it has been extremely reliable even in the worst conditions. Out here in the shack we got a bit of some thunderstorms. Woo! Rain's going sideways around Starlink, and you would think that I couldn't get anything done right now. It is worst case scenario for Starlink as far as weather goes. Normally I'm getting around 400, 300 to 400 down. Best case scenario for me on Starlink, like I said, best case is 3 to 400. We typically see 2 to 300 megabit with 400 megabit spikes and 15 to 50 megabit upload speed. It's never gone down other than a late night firmware update and we have 30 acres or so on this lot and a little over six of it covered with reliable Wi-Fi. The home office building got dropped here by the road with the intention of giving fiber because the fiber company contacted us and told us they would be in our area. However, so right here is where fiber stopped. They went all the way down this dirt road where almost nobody lives. They ran the rest of the run down here all the way around the other side of this horseshoe of a road. They left, but they did not finish the run to do the our house, the last house on the road. See, despite the fact that you can see the house right there, so they would have had to run to that last telephone pole, a terrible, and across to where the home lab building is. After they stopped four poles down and refused to get back to me on price and eventually just ghosted me, we went with Starlink and we couldn't be happier. At the time, the fastest package the fiber provider offered was 100 megabit sequential, so while we gave up some upload speed, Starlink is actually faster down than the fiber provider. Now, I am using the official pole mount sold on the Starlink website. Before permanently installing the dish, I would recommend using the bipod and running it for a few days to collect obstruction data before cementing the pole in place permanently. Now, the image on their website shows them burying the pole to where the cable comes out, but we get winners that approach minus 30 freedom units. So with the frost, I buried the pole so the cable was at least 18 inches beneath the ground. So other than frost, this also protects the, ca the cable from the weed whacker. Now when you first come in the shack, one of the first things you're going to notice and what most people point out is the tarp walls. When the buildings were dropped, we had two months to finish them before the lease on the other wife's apartment and my rented office space ran out. And I didn't realize our road was closed for another month for mud season to big trucks. So while the delivery company that brought the buildings was willing to cowboy it and just send it, none of, the, none of the supply places were. So I had to use the OG wife's van to get our electrical supplies. I actually paid more for the fire retardant tarps than I would have for sheets of OSB and paint to finish the walls. And despite the tarps, the walls are fully insulated. And despite extremely cold winters, I've been able to heat it all last winter with a single 1500 watt heater and cool it for two summers with a portable AC unit. For power, there is 6.3 UFB wire feeding the building. It's getting 50 amps from the main distribution panel. It stepped down to 30 amps at this panel, and the 30 amp has been plenty so far. Now this is a separate building, so it had to have its own shutoff and its own earth ground with two eight foot ground rods in a loop. And New York is on NEC 2017 for all you armchair inspectors out there. Now each workbench service stack my desktop, etc. is on its own circuit, so pop breakers are not a possibility unless something's actually shorted somewhere. When you come inside the shack, the first thing for technology you're going to come across is my five-year-old daughter Parker's PC. Her older sisters have their PCs in their room, but she shares a room with her sister Briar, and we still haven't found a permanent place for Park's battle station in the house yet, so she plays out here or on the TV in my bedroom or in the living room. My main desktop is powered Ryzen 5800X3D with a Soyo 5700XT driving two 1440p ultra wides and a 4K Samsung display. The Asus display under the 4K Samsung is for the, that workbench. Now under that workbench is my main server. The unique case was actually from one of the first PCs I ever built and sold professionally over 20 years ago. I was recently doing a large Wi-Fi deployment on the customer's property and he mentioned he still had the PC and was looking to recycle it. So I took it in for recycling just to build a new server in its case. I have a video on the original build and the server build up on the channel so go check that out after. 
two workbenches with anti-static mats and grounding cable all around each each bench so you have additional ESD protection to jack onto. Each bench has a harness with display, power, network, USB extension cables. Um, the extension cables are for wireless dongles for the wireless keyboard and mouse each bench has. All right, so getting back to the network stack for those that are here for the Starlink content, Starlink comes into the shack into my network bookcase. I have the router in pass-through mode going to this Optiplex 3040 with an i5-6500, 12 gigabytes of RAM running OpenSense as our firewall. The Optiplex feeds an 8-port gigabit switch that feeds some of my slower legacy devices. It then jumps to an 8-port multi-gig switch I also have a dedicated video on. Each RJ45 port supports up to 2.5 gigabit and it has one 10 gigabit SFP port I plan on moving my server over to. Just keep in mind the SFP port only works with fiber modules, DACs will not work. And for whatever reason, the faster speed indication light is orange and the slower speed indication light is green, which is opposite of most switches. Link EAP225 access point. And before the comment section goes off about Unify as an MSP, I've deployed hundreds of each. And between my experience with warranty service, between the two companies, the higher failure rates I've seen with my deployed unified products and the general better price to performance, I went with Omada for my Wi-Fi solution. Yes, I know these are supposed to be ceiling mounted, but this placement has not affected the signal strength or the overall range in any meaningful way. It used to actually be ceiling mounted out here, but the cable I ran in the wall was a cheap pre-made patch cable and it happened to be fake. It was supposed to be Cat5e but most of the cables in that batch have had issues negotiating at max speed. In a gigabit switch, it'll auto-negotiate to 100 megabit instead of gigabit half the time. And in a 2.5 gig switch, it'll usually negotiate at gigabit instead of 2.5. Cutting the ends revealed that it was actually copper-clad aluminum wires, so the access point is temporarily installed here forever. Now you may notice I don't have any managed switches. I use virtual access points and guest networks to isolate any outside untrusted devices. If it's plugged in, it's a trusted device. And as you will see in the house, the house is entirely wireless. So from the Yang Li switch, it goes outside to this big CPE 710. It runs at up to 867 megabit at five gigahertz. And yes, this is real world performance and it has a gigabit port. They usually around $70 each on Amazon and have an extremely long range. Now, Downrange from the CPE 710 is the house with the CPE 510. This model costs around $40 and are much more compact, blend in better, and usually pass the wife test a lot better than those big 710s. But they're only capable of 300 megabit at 5 gigahertz, and TP-Link's biggest Achilles heel with these is they only have a 10-100 port, so you're limited to 100 um, megabit regardless of what your Wi-Fi link is. Now, when I deployed these, I thought we were getting a 100 megabit sequential fiber connection. So for that application, it was fine. And even though Starlink is typically two to 300 megabits, 100 megabits has been plenty for the house. Now, anything from Ubiquity in this form factor that is, all, is also only going to be around three to 400 megabit wirelessly, but with a gigabit port. However, those are three times as much as the 510 and almost twice as much as the 710. So if the kids start complaining the internet is slow, I'll swap it out with another 710 and then the house and shop will have an over 800 megabit reliable link. Now the CPE runs back into the house to this PoE switch with a single EAP-225 inside. Then cables run back outside to a pair of outdoor EAP-225s that bookend the house. Back outside on this side of the house is a second 510 on a pole, also in line of sight of the first 710 giving another 100 megabit link back to another building. This time it's the other wife's cabin. It was her temporary master, master bedroom as we were getting everybody under one roof, but now it's just our guest cabin. It has an EAP-225 outdoor um, access point mounted the outside of the building, feeding the cabin and the backfield. So all in all, we have well over six acres with fast, reliable internet. But that's it for this low quality video. I will see you guys in the next one. Come on, dog, let's go.